thank you to Costantino and to Paul Fiorelli and Donato, all the organizers of this fabulous event. Um, wish I could be with you in person. Um, so I wanted to talk to you. Uh, well, first of all, I should tell you who I am. So I have spent the past 25 plus years uh, having the privilege of exclusively representing whistleblowers under what I now term to be the North American Whistleblower Reward Program. So I know you've heard a lot today about retaliation uh, against whistleblowers, and that is more of an employment law concept, a very important one, but I am actually not an employment lawyer and I don't do uh, retaliation law. What I do do is actually I sort of like a matchmaker. I take people with information um, that is valuable to various U.S. and Canadian um, government agencies, and I match them uh, with those agencies who pay them, in essence, as confidential informants for that information. It's often referred to as the uh, whistleblower reward programs. You've already heard today discussion about, and Martha gave you some of the statistics on uh, the SEC program. I'm going to kind of walk you through uh, the American and the Canadian um, programs. Uh, I think it's important to emphasize that Canada also um, has rewards because it's often a, a a myth that this is only an American idea. Um, in fact, it's North American idea. And as a fellow Commonwealth country to uh, the UK, it's interesting to see that Canada has also sort of adopted these uh, programs and made them their own. Uh, before I jump in and I'll share my slides to uh, the specifics of these programs, I wanted to set the stage of why I'm talking to you at a very unique moment in the United Kingdom. Um, it, I have, I had the, um, my law firm, Constantine Cannon's International Whistleblower Practice, and I had the pleasure of living for three years in London, um, at which point I was really actively recruiting international and UK whistleblowers to come to the American and the Canadian programs. Uh, and what my, my reaction when I would introduce myself at cocktail parties was always that um, from the UK side, there was skepticism about Americans paying rewards to whistleblowers. Um, and often I think it came from a, uh, a bias that, you know, Americans rightly or wrongly are perceived as overly mercenary or transactional. And so the idea was, oh, you Americans, you have to pay whistleblowers to do the right thing. We're British. We blow the whistle because it's the right thing to do. Um, so I think there, and, you know, there had been some flirtations by the UK government, including the Financial Conduct Authority, of potentially adopting American style reward programs. And those were sort of dismissed out of hand. Frankly, if you look at some of the reasons of the F FCA, which did it, I think, in around 2018, it was come some very sloppy reasoning. So uh, we're talking to you now where there seems to be a momentum at this very present moment in the UK to actually have an appetite to reconsider um, not just rewards, but really to to um, re-energize the UK's whistleblower laws. Um, a couple of things have happened in the past couple of weeks that have really brought this to the fore. Um, so Nick Fgrave, who is the new head of the Serious Frauds Office, which I know is where Costa used to work, um, actually came out recently with a statement at RUSI at the Royal United Services Organization and basically said that he was in favor of paying rewards to whistleblowers. Kind of an interesting idea. He comes at it not as a lawyer. He worked in law enforcement and sort of sees the intuitive value because um, in law enforcement, we often pay um, confidential inform informants for information. So that was a sort of very interesting um, development. And then significantly, the Labor Party just had their conference um, and uh, David Lammy, one of the shadow MPs, uh, said that if Labor... Um, is becomes the new leading party that they will actually, one of the first things they will do is to introduce legislation um, about a whistleblower reward program. So it is very timely and topical at the moment. So I'm not just speaking to you from American vantage point, but I'm speaking to you about things that may actually be a live issue um, for those of you on the other side of the pond today. Um, let me share my screen with you. Just one second, so I can walk you through a few of the Canadian and American programs. 
Just a moment. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen, everybody? Can someone give me a shout out if you can? <laughs> um, I think I'm flying blind. You can see it. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour of our programs. As I said earlier, what is a reward program? It is basically um, setting up an office as a whistleblower inside a particular agency where you welcome whistleblowers to bring you inside information. Um, and if you use that information, if the agency uses that information, if the information is voluntary and original um, to impose a fine, a whistleblower can receive a percentage of the fine that the agency imposed basically as a finder's fee, as a bounty, as a reward, or in the UK, as we like to say now, almost as like unemployment insurance, as a safe financial safety net for whistleblowers to give them a reason to undertake the risk of whistleblowing. So in the US, um, we love whistleblower programs. I'm gonna walk you through these two slides to show you how much we love them. We have multiple programs, but I wanna move in order of, um, Chronology, uh, the first whistleblower program we had came in 1863. It's called the False Claims Act. We actually stole the concept from the United Kingdom. Um, it is uh, what's called the Key Tam Statute. Key Tam stands for a longer Latin phrase of he who stands in the shoes of the king as well as himself. And it's really a concept where we don't just empower whistleblowers to provide tips to the agency like the SEC. Under the DOJ's False Claims Act program, we actually empower whistleblowers to launch a lawsuit in the name of the United States government when we know that government taxpayer dollars have been misappropriated. So um, this program um, is a program where, for instance, if defense contractors, for instance, if Boeing were selling defective planes to the United States military and a whistleblower worked in Boeing and knew of this, that's the kind of person who could launch a lawsuit in the name of the government under the False Claims Act. Uh, another example in the U.S., a lot of it is healthcare fraud, the Medicare program, lots of whistleblowers who work at medical device companies or pharmaceutical companies or provider groups or health insurance companies selling um, healthcare services product into to the United States that they know is either um, defective or overbilling. Um, for that sort of service, um, uh, that is another area where a whistleblower can bring information. So that's our original uh, grandfather of our grandmother of our false of our whistleblower programs, where we pay rewards. Those whistleblowers, when they launch the cases, if those cases are successful, they can get fifteen to twenty five percent. So that is the first program. And it's interesting, I'll show you some of the statistics, but they're not even up to date because last week the Justice Department issued new statistics for last year on the success of the False Claims Act. But suffice it to say close to $80 um, billion has been recovered as a result of whistleblower lawsuits um, that were initiated by whistleblowers. Um, it's actually those staggering statistics and the success of those programs that has inspired all of these agencies that you're seeing now to the left of the DOJ um, to actually say, hey, we should use whistleblowers too. They seem to be uh, basically providing cake in a box to these prosecutors. Basically, these whistleblowers come with inside information. They give a roadmap to the fraud. Uh, they're uniquely well-placed. Um, we can spend all our resources trying to investigate from the outside, but why wouldn't we try and incentivize an insider to bring us the information that could help deliver us a successful prosecution and best lever leverage our resources? So the IRS, the SEC, and the CFTC all have whistleblower reward programs. The IRS, IRS was the first agency to say, we're not going to let uh, whistleblowers do what they do in the DOJ context under the False Claims Act. We're not going to let them sue in our name, but we are going to let them give us tips. Um, and in fact, we're going to let them give us these tips anonymously, which as we heard from Martha is very powerful when you're either do, talking about an internal or an external reporting mechanism. It can be, it can really diminish the risks that a whistleblower faces if they're allowed to report 
anonymously um, and uh, if the agency is going to keep their their name and their identity private, which is in the vast majority of cases what happens. So the IRS was the first agency to do that um, and to set up an office of the whistleblower. Very significant that each of these agencies sets up an office of the whistleblower because whistleblowers often don't know to whom they should report. So um, this takes a lot of the mystery out of it and it actually ensures that the tip gets in the right hands of the right person inside that agency who's, who is charged under these statutes um, to actually look at the information and get it, and if it clears the hurdle, get it into the hand of enforcement attorneys who'll actually act on it. So first one was IRS, and then as we all know, in the wake of the financial crisis in the United States, we had the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act, and there's an interesting story that starts uh, starts this. Um, there's The origin stories are always what's interesting. Donato was just talking about the origin stories with the LuxLeaks whistleblowers. Antoine Del Tor actually was the inspiration inspiration for the EU whistleblowing directive that um, Costa talked about. Well, in the United States, there was a whistleblower by the name of Harry Markopoulos, who was the inspiration for the whistleblower office creation within the SEC and the CFTC in the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act. Harry Markopoulos was a whistleblower outsider, just a financial advisor in Boston who was advising his clients. And he looked at what Bernie Madoff was um, offering. And he said, this is a Ponzi scheme. These these degrees of returns he's promising are statistically impossible. So he went to the SEC's office in Boston three times, slide decks showing it all, and was completely ignored. So when the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act was put into place, the idea was no longer will we have these sorts of situations where whistleblowers can't get their information to the right people to be heard. We will now create this office of the whistleblower and encourage them. And there's, in fact, there's a special website you can go on and you upload your information immediately. And there's a whole team of people who take that information. So that's incredibly powerful. So I've kept all of these on one page because these are the ones that everybody knows about. Um, we started to hear some of the statistics about the success of the SEC program, but what, those of you who maybe have not stayed um, current with this developing field may not know that these program, these two agencies have also gone ahead um, since the time of the advent of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform whistleblower programs have added their own. So in 2015, the U.S. Transportation Department now in, in, in something that is a... Um, is unique, right? On, the, on these slides here, we're talking mostly about financial frauds or other private contracting frauds. The DOT's program is the first time in the United States that we actually have a program that gets at safety um, and rewards whistleblowers bringing information about defects um, uh, in, in cars and, and other modes of transportation that end up in the United States, um, on, on roads in the United States. Um, we had the pleasure of representing a whistleblower named Mr. Kim, one of the first whistleblowers to get a reward under this program. He, interestingly, um, hails from Seoul, South Korea, um, and he worked at Hyundai and knew that engines on certain Hyundai cars were seizing and bursting into flames at high speeds. Um, he tried to raise the issue internally, um, which was a very brave thing to do. He then brought it externally to uh, the U.S. regulators, um, the Department of Transportation, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and received a $24 million reward um, to help the DOT impose a multi-hundred of millions of dollar fine on the company. So I'm very proud of that program because it um, moves beyond just the financial arena into um, into safety and protecting the driving public. Um, also very interesting, timely and current, the Treasury Department now has two programs. Um, they're called FinCEN, which uh, the FinCEN programs, it's a department under Treasury, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Um, they started with a kleptocracy asset recovery. So basically, where do the proceeds of crime go? Where have they ended up? And in fact, whistleblowers could be very helpful in identifying where proceeds of crime have gone. So that was one of our first programs out of the treasury. And then um, in 21 and 2022, um, they have a new program for allowing whistleblowers to bring information about violations of the US Bank Secrecy Act, which is one of our biggest um, laws that protects against money laundering. And then very significantly, of course, with the advent of the Ukraine war, um, 
whistleblowers now can bring information to Treasury and actually to our Office of Foreign Assets Control um, about violations of US sanctions laws. So what does that mean meant for me in my career is that I started um, doing defense contractor fraud and Medicare fraud and now um, have the great pleasure of in a day handling a file that deals with auto safety or Russian sanctions or Iran or Syria, or um, it just allows their, me to have a very uh, wide ranging practice and just shows the value that Americans place on properly incentivizing whistleblowers to bring information to the government. Um, I won't spend any time on this, but this is just to let you know that our False Claims Act, that original program, actually a bunch of states, so close to 31 states and eight municipalities actually have their own False Claims Acts to protect their tax payer dollars and to incentivize whistleblowers to help them. So it's not just uh, if you live in one of these states listed on the right, for those of you at Xavier University, you could bring a false claims that case if you know taxpayer dollars or you misappropriated. Canada, I told you I'd tell you about Canada. So Canada has two programs. The one on the right, uh, the Ontario Securities Commission program is very similar to the SEC's program. However, um, they uh, made it their own. They made it Canadian. They didn't just adopt it wholesale. And so whereas the American SEC program gives whistleblowers 10 to 30 percent of any recovery, the OSC has uh, a more modest range, 5 to 15 percent. And whereas the American rewards, um, you get 10 to 30 percent um, with no cap on the amount that a whistleblower can receive, uh, the o OSC program puts a cap of 5 million Canadian. So um, one of the largest rewards that the SEC has paid has to a whistleblower has exceeded $200 million. That would not be the case in Canada. It would have gotten capped at 5 million. Of course, for a $200 million uh, reward, it means you would have uh, exposed a multi, often billion dollar uh, fraud. And so my estimation, I'm obviously not in favor of caps, but it is one way uh, it's it's a it's an alternate approach. It's a different approach from a difference between maybe a Commonwealth country and and the United States, which is something to to point out. And then on the other side, the Canada Reve Revenue Agency, they actually have an offshore tax informant program. If you know about Canadians who are hiding assets overseas, um, they welcome and pay rewards to whistleblowers who bring that information forward. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time. Uh, I can we can share the slide deck later, but you know here are some of the, the sort of stunning facts and figures in terms of how these programs have performed over the years. Um, but what I do want to show um, is something that picks up uh, a little bit. Well, one of the things I do want to say is that what's been remarkable about the US whistleblower programs, particularly the SEC program, is the um, reach of these programs. So some of the data that is particularly interesting is that whistleblowers from outside the United States, in fact, whistleblowers from Canada and the UK are two of the largest countries who supply tips to the US program. So I think there's a misperception that you have to be American to bring tips to the United States. Um, obviously, um, that's not the case. And in fact, some people who have the best information as it relates to uh, violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, so bribery of government, foreign government officials, or as it relates to sanctions violations, by definition, a lot of these kinds of frauds that the American government is interested are happening overseas. And so by definition, some of the best place whistleblowers will also be overseas. So um, there's been a lot of effort by practitioners like myself and others to try and recruit uh, those kinds of whistleblowers. Um, so I didn't want you to labor under the notion that you have to be American or work for an American company um, to bring that kind of information forward. Um, so, the last thing I want to talk about really brings us full circle back to sort of Martha, Sarah's, re, re, um, some of her remarks. And I just wanted to pick up on where she was, which is um, a lot of the criticisms that are leveled at the whistleblower reward programs are that, well, if we incentivize and give whistleblowers a carrot to go external to the government, won't that undermine 
internal remort reporting mechanisms. Um, and the data on that is actually, the answer so far has been no. Um, uh, the slide that I think is really interesting and, Kara, uh, and Martha alluded to this is that the data coming out of the SEC, the SEC has to report, uh, do an annual report to Congress once a year on this, uh, the data coming out of their programs, how their program, their SEC whistleblower program is performing. And year over year, um, they track um, the as to the folks who received rewards, whistleblowers who were the recipients of reward, they found that hovering around 80% of those whistleblowers all reported internally first. So that kind of puts a lie to this notion that whistleblowers uh, are going to bypass internal reporting channels and, and, and go straight to the government. It's what I've known anecdotally in my practice is that whistleblowers often don't even know that they're whistleblowers. Uh, they're just doing their job. If you're head of internal audit and you're reporting on an audit failing that has a significant effect on um, your reporting obligations for your quarterly earnings report and someone doesn't like that and wants to hide that, then you frequently become treated like a whistleblower um, and you don't even know that you're a whistleblower. So the point is that whistleblowers are starting at their companies and telling them about problems. And the problem is it seems to be there is a gap in the listening up by um, companies who are encouraging people to speak up. Um, the last thing I'll say on that point um, before I end is that whistleblowers um, under the SEC program, if you um, do report internally first, remember you're entitled to a range of 10 to 30% of any reward. It's considered a plus factor if you report it internally first in terms of getting a higher share of your reward. So there's ways that we, um, the program is designed to actually encourage internal reporting. I am going to stop sharing my screen and turn it back to Dorothy and thank you all for um, your attention.